when I realized I was going to do the club and everybody was coming to me for reinvention, I started sort of digging into how do you reinvent and what can we offer people for reinvention? And what I believe is that everybody's reinvention journey is going to be different. Welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. On the show, it's my job to tease out the creative solutions my guests are coming up with to change the world through creativity, social action, and mindset. I also give you tips and techniques so you can do the same. This episode is brought to you by my class, Meditation for Busy People, where you'll learn how to relieve stress and discover clarity and joy in just five minutes a day. It's also brought to you by the Brain FM app and this podcast host, Podbean. Also, follow the podcast on Instagram or TikTok and check out our shop for merch, music, and musings. The links are all in the show notes. Hello and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for being here. I am thrilled to welcome this week's guest. Let me tell you about Leslie Jane Seymour. Leslie is the founder of Covey Club, launched in 2017. Covey Club holds a space for women 40 plus, and you know that's catnip to me since I am way 40 plus, while they figure out what is next for, next for them. Covey Club offers classes, a blog, a weekly podcast called Reinvent Yourself with Leslie Jane Seymour, networking groups, and a private social app. From 2008 to 2016, Leslie served as the editor-in-chief of Moore Magazine, and in July of 2015, Seymour created history by having the First Lady of the UN USA, Michelle Obama, guest at it an entire issue. How cool is that? Before taking over Moore, Seymour served as editor-in-chief to a bunch of magazines that I read all the time for Marie Claire, Red Book, and YM. I'm kind of assuming YM is Young Miss, but maybe it's something else. I'm going to have to ask. She's the author of two books, On the Edge, 100 Years of Vogue, and I Wish My Parents Understood. Seymour is also a certified tiny habit coach. Leslie, thank you so much for being here. Wow. <laughs> I feel like to I, need to, here. I need to genuflect for a second because I've been reading these magazines for years and years and I years. Know. Amazing. That is so cool. I, I am so thrilled that you're here and I want to talk so much about Covey Club and what you've done to help women in their 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond reinvent themselves. But I'd love yes. to start with, if you don't mind. Sure. What got you to that point? What <laughs> made you go, you know what? I've been doing this corporate yes. thing and I've been so involved in women's, not women's issues, uh, unless you say women's magazine issues, but I've been so involved in, in women's lives. Now I want to do things very differently. How did you get from here to there? Well, it's very similar to that. I mean, I came into this whole thing as a writer and a journalist. I mean, that was my whole goal was, was being able to write. Mm. and have my voice heard. And when I got into women's magazines, what I found was really the service we were providing, no matter where I was working, even though I started out in the fashion field, was making sure that women were taken care of mm. and their voices were heard. They were getting the information they needed. They were getting the health information that they needed. Um, you know, it's terrible to say, but if women were not poorly treated as a second class citizen, I probably would not have had much of a career. But because we were, that really was what women's magazines were about. And when more folded in 2016, I said, you know, my whole life has been working with women, showing them how to be heard, addressing their issues, finding the information for them so that they can move forward am I going to quit this just because, just because print is going out of fashion? Mm -hmm. How can I continue doing this? And lucky for me, the internet was where it was. Right. And I decided, heck no, let me figure out how to do the same thing. And I love, I love, I'm a Uber extrovert. So I love meeting people live instead of being in print and this voice in a, um, you know, on a page, I said, let me try to do it, you know, in a live way. And so I literally just started the podcast. I jumped in and said, nobody's talking to women like me who need help on reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. I was not going to go and be another editor in chief. The magazine business was really circling the drain. Mm -hmm. And there was no one to help me as old. There was no one to talk to. Like when I said, you know, like, how do I do this? I had all my friends were still staying in, in the 
magazine business. They were trying to keep it going. They were waiting for the next gig. They didn't care if it was going to be just two years. They'd be in and be out because they didn't know what else to do. So I had to kind of forge this all by myself and it was very hard. And I said, I want to help other women transition like I'm doing. And really I took my social media, my readers came to me on social media. They were very upset. The magazine closed Mm. and said, do something else for us. And I said, like, I don't know what that is. I gave them a 54 question survey and 627 of them filled it out, which today is laughable because no one will fill out three questions on a survey. Mm. And I mapped out what Covey Club might be. And I just took a slice of it. I read a few books about, you know, the lean up, the lean um, startup. And I did a slice of it. I thought I was going to be an online magazine because that's what I knew. And um, that worked for about three months until I realized it was costing me $12,000 a month to make my own magazines um, and no one wanted to pay for them Mm. (laughs) digitally. So I had to figure out what else it could be. And what I decided was let's lean into the word club. I always knew it would be a club. I knew it had to be more than just a magazine. I knew that, but I didn't know what that meant. And so I sort of leaned into the club. I've taught before as an adjunct professor at uh, NYU. I love teaching. I love sharing. I'm a gatherer and a connector. Mm -hmm. And so I said, let me lean into that and see what this could be. And basically that's how Covey Club was born. And the word Covey means, it means a small group of birds, basically a small group of quail. And I was looking for fun, little, small, cozy words. I wanted to use, I wanted to call it the murder club because it's a murder of crows. (laughs) But a lot of, all these people who were friends of mine who were on the serious money side, they were like, no, 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 you can't do that. No one's going to get it. They're not going to think it's funny. I know you think it's funny. And then the other one was, what was the other one? Something in bitches. They didn't like that either. And so I came up with Covey and that's where we are. That's fabulous. I think that's amazing that you, that you spearheaded this thing for yourself because there was no one. I'm I'm kind of going, no one. I, I wish that I had known you five years ago because I, you and I could have helped each other. I had a full career at NASA before NASA. I, yeah, I worked at NASA for 20 plus years and then went, you know, I, I made my husband leave DC and we moved to New York and, and it was, it is this entire process. And frankly, here's the thing. I don't have the energy I had in my twenties or thirties. And that means that I have to be strategic with what I do. And I guess right. I'm wondering for you, you're you're talking to women, many of whom have already had, you know, they've had their kids, they're perhaps empty nesters, they're they're moving on to the next phase, but there's a not only a well, what do I do next, but what are my resources? And also right. how do I find the energy for this? How do I find the energy to reinvent myself? What are your thoughts about these three questions? See, so interesting because I find I have more energy. Isn't that weird? I mean, I don't have that energy in terms of, I look back and I say, how the hell did I, you're going to laugh because I was in the fashion business. So every Mm. morning I had to get up before I took care of my kids, before I fed them breakfast, I washed and blew my hair out and did a full makeup, Wow, which was an hour and a half process. I have a lot of hair. Hair was a nightmare, but you had to, that was what you thought you had to do. What a waste of time. Right. Mm. And I thought I had to do that. And then I would take care of my kids. I would drop them off at school. Then I would get on a train and go to work and do all my things and go out to lunch and then come back and do an evening event and then come back on the train. That part of it, that kind of like just being in the wheel. I don't know that I could do that again. Mm. But in terms of overall energy, I guess I just find I have so much more energy now because I'm more focused. I'm doing my own thing. I don't have to report to a bunch of dumb guy bosses. Sorry, (laughs) dumb guy bosses out there who say stupid things like, my wife says you should. Oi. Uh, Yeah. Your wife, who's never been an editor before, says what? Um, (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dumb stuff like that. Or um, I just find my energy is better because 
again, my kids are grown. I'm not coming home to kids who need to be fed and bathed and put into the, you know, into the bath. Um, I find I have more time for myself now and more time to really figure out who I am and where I'm going. And I'll tell you what I'm not wasting my time on. And I'd love to hear if you feel this way too. I don't give a crap about what anybody else thinks anymore. <laughs> I wasted Isolda. I don't know about you, but I'm like the good girl, right? Mm. I'm the girl I want. I'm a people pleaser. I want everybody to love me. Boy, was that hard hanging with the mean girls at Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and all mm. that. So I wasted so much energy on that. Right. And I was constantly monitoring all these people and what they thought of me and if they were mean to me and why they were mean to me. And they were probably mean to me because they just had a bad day or they hated themselves or, you know, that I mean, it was all about them. I thought it was about me. I didn't realize. And now I'm like, you know, I'm probably on the other side, which is like, you know, I'm not going to please everybody. If you don't like me, that's fine. <laughs> It's just totally fine. I could still <laughs> like you, but if you don't like me, fine. I don't care. There's many people in the world. I don't need you. We'll move on. But I wasted a lot of energy mm. on examining myself. I worked in a, in a copy room, um, at Vogue with five other writers. This is really before downsizing happened before McKinsey got hold of, I read the McKinsey book, which, explained my whole career life, mm. um, you know, before downsizing came and they just, you know, chopped everybody because they decided they couldn't make more revenue, but they could cut their expenses. Right. So there were six people in the copy room of Vogue. I mean, I was bored to tears because I was writing one portfolio a month and wanted to shoot myself. Cause I'm, I'm a doer, right. I'm really mm. fast and furious and everybody was mean. And you'd walk in there and they would make some snotty remark to you. And, and my day would be shot and I'd mm. be spending all my energy trying to figure out what I did wrong. And, you know, looking back, I know I had not, it wasn't about me. It was about them. They had some, you know, they were having a fight with their husband or they were, who knows what was going on, but I took it all personally. So I, I love, I don't know. I love, I'm much happier today and I can focus on my health. Yes. Health issues are there where they weren't before we took that for, um, you know, we took that for granted, but there's a lot that you can do about it. And if you educate yourself, um, you can really, you know, bring your energy back up. I so love that you said that. And there is something so powerful about being, in the space where you're living, and it sounds cliche, but I'm gonna say it anyway, where you're living your truth, what you're meant to be yes. doing. It, it sounds yes. to me like you are, which I think is great. Yes. But yes. I have to I have to sort of come back to that and say, sure. okay, these are women, the women that you're serving and helping, probably if they're anything like I was, they were, okay, whew, I've done this and now what next? What do I do? Right, what and, do I do next? Right. right. And so, so you and I do something similar. I, I have a company called Creative Earthlings where I help people find their creativity and, and unleash it. And I think it's great that Covey Club has a, a facet of that for sure. But I'm wondering when someone comes to you and they're like, okay, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't know exactly what to do. I just know I need right. to make a change. What's right. the first step? What do the you have them do? Well, here's the interesting thing. Again, as I said to you, I thought I was going to be a magazine. I did not know I was going to be in the reinvention business. Mm. More the, how I wandered into the reinvention business is because Moore used to have a column which was called Second Acts. It was mm. really well read. And we used to do these dramatic, you know, really dramatic changes, life changes. And we would always focus on the how-to part of it. So people kept coming to me for reinvention advice and it was always, you know, friends in the beauty business and they would call me, you know, like November and they'd be huddled in a corner somewhere and they'd be like, oh my God, I have to call you. I need help. I think I'm about to be fired. I'm like, oh my God, like when, like now, like you need to be, we need to be talking about this two, two years ago. Like you need a plan. So I started going out there talking about how you needed to have a reinvention plan in your back pocket. And when I realized I was going to do the club and everybody was coming to me for reinvention, I started sort of digging into how do you reinvent and what can we offer people for reinvention and what I, what I believe 
is that everybody's reinvention journey is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And originally I thought, um, like you were saying, like, oh, I was going to help you in the beauty business figure out what your thing is next. What I realized is that we can put education in front of you. We can put experts in front of you. We can put the tools and the services in front of you. And for each person, it's a poo-poo platter and you decide I need, you know, two spoonfuls of coaching. I need a little sprinkling of, you know, uh, down digital downsizing. I need, you know, a health coach. I need this. What in each person's going to have a different journey. Mm -hmm. So what we say at Covey Club is we hold a space for you while you figure out what's next. Right? We're holding that space. You're going to come to us a couple of days a week. We teach twice a week. I bring in experts like you, and I'm going to make you come talk to us too, because you've got such a fascinating background and what you do is so much a part of what we do. Um, and then they go off and they find those people, the books they want to read, the whatever. And then mm. we put people together in small little pods where they work on things that they're interested in. Could be elder care. It could be reinvention of their um, career, reinvention of other. It could be writing. It could be marketing. It could be building your own website, whatever the things are. And we do both friendship and business. That's mm. what's unusual about us. Because as you get older, I believe that you start to do business with your friends because For sure. frankly, if I know you and you do podcasting and I like you and I believe in you, why would I go start searching the internet? I, mm -hmm. I don't like, and I know that you have the same expertise. I'd rather do business with a friend, right? So that's kind of how we do our reinvention is we put it all out there and you find your way across and that's what happens. And people meet each other, they connect, they do business, they listen, they find the services, they find the help, they find the coaching, they find the they find the the items. Maybe it might be that they want to lose weight. They we have tons and tons of content. Of course, I come out of the content field um, at the um on the website, um, written by some of the best writers in the world. We have how-tos, we have essays, we have everything to do with midlife and any kind of reinvention you might want to do, because some people it's going to be career. Some people it's reinventing their energy levels. Some people it's reinventing their bodies. Some people it's reinventing their connection with their older kids, reinventing their finances, rethinking their relationship with their other, whatever it is, there's a change going on. And one of the great things to do is to do it with women like us, because we all are going through the same thing. It doesn't matter that you worked for NASA and I worked for magazines. When we are reinventing, we are all the same. I call it the lobster effect. You know, when the lobster grows out of its shell mm -hmm. and it's, you know, that's when down here in New Orleans, when we go after the soft shelled crabs, it's only a moment where they're at their crab, they're building their next shell, right? They've got to discard the old one and they're completely naked and they're crawling along the bottom. And that's us when you're reinventing, you're naked and you need the help and you're all the same. It doesn't matter what you were doing before. Reinvention is a leveling moment. And it's also a bonding moment, much like when you have kids, much like your teenage years, much like your first years at, at work. It's that kind of, what do you want to call it? It's a kind of sisterhood moment where you really can jump in and help each other and, and make, you know, lifelong friends because you're going through it together. I'm taking a second. You, you'll notice that <laughs> when, when, when I hear something that's particularly profound, I have, I call it, some people call it dead air. I call it anticipatory <laughs> air. Okay. So, so I I'm was like, uh oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, that's why I give warning. I'm like, oh yeah, I it's should let okay, her know. No problem. I, I'm, I'm fascinated. And I am, I think what you're saying is so profound because we are in a position now to, to take power for ourselves as women. Yes. We're, we're in this position. It's a unique time in history for us yes. in that so many different possibilities exist. And there are so many 
places of tension, right? We yes. have to sort of step up and be badass about about how we do this. And what you said is, well, the point is well made that, yes, we absolutely can choose and it can be different for everybody. And there are women out there I know who are not quite ready to be badass, right? They're not quite ready yes. to go, yeah, I'm here and I'm right. doing it. So, <laughs> right. so when when there's fear in this really badass way that you are talking about all of right. this, where does a woman, is there a place in Covey Club for a woman who knows that, that this is something she wants, but is afraid to begin? Yes. And that is actually, you can come and you can get onto our a newsletter. You don't have to join. You can buy a class here and there, pop in when you want, come to an event and slowly dip your toe in. And one of the things, as you mentioned, I'm a tiny habits coach. And one of the reasons I, I don't want to be a full-time coach, there are enough coaches in the world. They don't need me, but what <laughs> I really wanted, I, first of all, I fell in love with the whole idea of tiny habits and BJ Fogg's scientific approach to change. Mm. And the hardest part about reinvention is getting started. I mean, what's, what's really interesting. And I had never been an entrepreneur before the hard part about starting Covey club was this lack of momentum, right? When mm. you change jobs in the corporate world, you're kind of like parachuting into this rushing stream. And the hard part is rowing the boat fast enough to catch up with the stream and figure it out where you are, right? When you're creating your own thing, and I remember this very vividly for two years, sitting at my dining room table, pushing a rock up a hill, it had no momentum. Mm. And for two years, I had to keep telling myself, don't worry, once it gets started and things start to move, it will have a momentum and a life of its own. But it's it was very hard to get to, you know, get through the thing of like, oh, well, it's never going to happen. We're never going to launch. It's never, no one's going to come. What's, I'm never going to have any momentum. And that's one of the hardest things I believe when you know that you have to make change is the concept is so big and so scary. You put it off because it's like that mountain's too big. I'm too afraid. And you procrastinate. Or you just decide to run away because it's too hard and you just decide I'm not going to do it. Tiny habits. And then also this silly little thing that I created myself, which are these 30 day challenges where we use a calendar to create five minute little movements that you mm. do every day for 30 days that move you in a direction. Like if you're, say you're not, you, you're a couch potato and you know, you've got to start exercising. If you start by walking you know, one block a day uh, or running one block a day. Say you just, you know, run your uh, a half a block a day and you just do that for 30 days and you run a half a block and then you run a full block and then you run one and a half blocks by 30 days. You're no longer a couch potato. You're a runner. So I take that idea and I apply it to whatever it is. You're a, a lawyer and you want to go into real estate. What are the, you know, little five minute motions. And I'm not talking about an hour. It's a five minute action that you can take each day that will move you into it. Well, I can Google who are the, you know, most important real estate people in my, um, in my area. I, that's where I can start. Then the next day I can say, who are the people I know who are in real estate? And you can put down to call one of them. And then the next day, and you can just do these things in small increments. And by 30 days, you're on your way to making that change for yourself happen. And that's true with any kind of change. And we, we mm. did a 30 day challenge, the first one we did in January, and it was fascinating to see what members did. And some members, because it was January, got really into the organizing and cleaning and decluttering thing. One woman started out with her linen closet and I, I made her do before and afters, which we posted. And she got so into it. She got so motivated by the momentum that she ended up cleaning out all of her records and all that stuff and got into her will. And then she said, and I'm going to do my digital photos next. And I was like, 
No, you don't, girlfriend. No one does digital photos. You've gone too far. Leave it alone. <laughs> you don't have to reinvent. You don't have to declutter into your photos. That's like, now you're becoming obsessive. And um, another woman decided that she was going to write a book of poetry. She was a writer. She had not actually done anything that was concrete. And she made herself, she sat down and wrote 21 poems in the month. And she put it together and she's publishing a book. Oh, fantastic. So you, it's, it's getting that momentum going and mm -hmm. getting the start going and getting the mindset going and getting the thinking going and seeing the change out there. I mean, you've heard this too, I'm sure. And, and I kind of laugh about it because I call it woo woo stuff, but it really is true. If you can see it, you can be it. And you have to have, I, I liken it to when I was at Vogue, you're going to laugh about this. I was a fashion and beauty writer, but they needed somebody to write the car column. Mm. And so I wasn't a driver because I'd been in the city my whole life and I didn't mm. need to drive. But my boss came to me and said, Miss Mirabella, I would like you to write the car column. I was a really good writer. And I looked at her and I said, does it matter that I don't drive? And she looked at me blank. <laughs> I had such a great boss. She, she just looked at me blankly. And I said, I said, funny, you caught me on the day I started my driving lessons. Tell her I'd love to do this. <laughs> and so I literally called Taggart's and I learned to drive when I was at Vogue and they sent me around the world learning to drive. And I was terrified but one of these guys, I would drive, I was the only woman in the group. Um, it was all guys and then me. And whenever I'd bring my husband, they thought it was him. Mm. So it was hilarious when they, they would take him off to go um, shopping with all the ladies. And um, <laughs> one of the things that I thought was fascinating was when they taught me that what I was doing wrong is I was looking too close at the road right in mm. front of me. Mm. And they kept saying, lift your head up and look way out, look as far out as you can. You have to see where you want to go. And Absolutely. it was very hard and very frightening in my twenties to do that. And they were right because mm. the car goes, goes to the future. It goes where you want it to go in the future, not in front of you. And in many ways, reinvention is that same thing. It's, you have to lift your head up and say, where is it I want to be? Because if you keep your head down and you're looking too close, you can't, you can't see the road in front of you. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny. I, I've been driving since the day I could at 16, but when I was learning how to ride motorcycles, one of the things that they said to us is you must, you are required to look in the direction you want to go. If you look anywhere but in the direction you want to go, you're going to crash. And oh, it becomes wow. this, this, oh, you mean I could die kind of thing. <laughs> but, but it's really, and I've tested it and tested it and tested it and tested it. And it works the same with a bike and it works the same, any two wheel uh, vehicle. If you are going, you must look at the, and no matter how weird the turn, if you're looking in that direction, your body yeah. will take you there. Yeah. And it's, it's that, it's that don't, you don't, there's, there's this weird disconnect between be present and also see the future. But I yes. think that that is a really good combination, especially for women who are reinventing themselves. So I, your point is well made again, profound. Thank you so much, Leslie. I appreciate <laughs> it. All the wacko, you know, the wacko, the wacko history you have in your life that you suddenly realize like, you know, that's the same thing. Right. This Absolutely. Weird thing I learned, you know, because I didn't know how to drive in my 20s and I had to write about it. But yes. But it, but it's interesting to me because like when I talk to my clients, I say something so similar. My thing is small steps are still steps. We tend to yes. think that unless Correct. we take a Correct. huge step Correct. Correct. and we jump off a cliff that we're not making That's any right. progress. That's right. So what is your what is your advice to a woman in Covey Club who's going, OK, I've started, but I'm not seeing any difference. When will I see a difference? Do you give them advice on patience or do you have something more concrete that you can say, well, here are the steps to take when you feel like you're, you've, you've sort of stalled in well, your reinvention. Each, each time is different. And that's why you've got to work with different people at different times. That's why we mm. put you in different pods so you can connect with different people who are moving at different rates and also who have different experiences and can help you get to where you're going. And you will have, it is definitely a roller coaster. It is not a straight shot. 
I think one of the most illuminating things is I had one woman come in and she was, she, I don't know why she didn't think about putting herself out there. She thought that if she just did her reinvention, she was a, um, or is a, uh, plus size model, a very gorgeous girl. Mm. And she wanted to, she used to make her business off of helping, um, producers get the right plus size, um, you know, sizing on everything. She was a size model. And so she would go in for that and that kind of dried up. And then she wanted to do these videos about how to dress and all this stuff. And I kept saying to her, why are you stopping? You've got to keep going. I mean, her stuff was fantastic. We would put, pu we would publish it on, um, coveyclub.com. She was so inspirational. She really had a flair for styling. And I said, you got to keep going. You got to reach out to people who are, you know, who need this kind of help. What about FIT? What about she was, and she was kind of like, oh, I thought that if I just did it, they would come to me. Mm. And I was like, wow, like that's such an interesting, I, I remember thinking that same thing when I was in corporate life, um, which I think is very female, which is if I just do a really good job, the fairy godmother is going to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, Hey, would you like a promotion? You're doing such a good job. And what I realized is I was all these horrible people around me were getting promoted because all they did was talk about themselves all day long and how mm. fabulous they were. And meanwhile, I was doing their work mm. and, um, that's not the way the world works. And so it was really interesting when she had that insight and I said, no, you've got to go out there with this. You can't, they're not just going to all come to you. Yes, you can hope, but you've got to go out and sell yourself. Now you have this fantastic package and you must sell it. So I think for each person, it's a different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. There's some people, I'll be honest, there's some people in the club who what what's really wonderful about the group experience is that there's some people, you know, there's some people who are just stuck. They're really stuck and you can hear them like a wheel stuck in the mud. They're kind of going, rrr, 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 mm -hmm. right? And the same, you get into a class, they're making the same comments. They're saying the same thing. They're not. And you're wondering, do they realize that they're not like moving along here? And I talked to a friend of mine who had been in my old publisher for, for one of the magazines. And she said, you know, Leslie, there's going to be a part of the club of, in the club who don't move. And you're just going to have to accept that. And I was like, wow, that's terrible that I'm just going to have to accept that there are people who are just hanging there and can't move. And what was so interesting is then like after two years, we were in a group event and this woman suddenly something must have gone off in her head. She saw other people were doing things that she could relate to. And she announced to the group, she said, I'm going to go into therapy. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay. And then she ended up changing. Wow. And she ended up getting into a different area. I was completely blown away. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to accept that, you know, everybody's route is different and maybe some people won't be able to move. But I do see that watching other people, I guess that's what group therapy is all about, is you look at people who have similar issues to you or worse issues to you and you're inspired by them because you're like, Hey, like, she's not that different from me. If she can do that, why can't I do that? And so maybe you push yourself a little bit harder. I don't think, I mean, yes, you can give people tools. I don't think you can force tools on people. I think that's why I come to look at Covey club as a, you know, as a buffet and you pick out what is right for you. I don't think, I mean, I think if people come to you or come to me and say, which tools do you think would be helpful? I can say what I think would be, but each person has to try what they're interested in. You have to have an open mind. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've learned through my podcast, interviewing women who've reinvented themselves is that it's mindset. Mm. And it's really the thing that holds every one of these people through health reinventions, widowhood, divorce, losing a job, losing five jobs, losing their parents, a job and their health all in one year. It is 
it's all mindset. And we know that mindset can be changed. And if you have an open mindset, there was a, a woman um, when we were at, at Moore and we used to do a lot of these interviews about reinvention. And I don't remember who said it, but she said, because I asked her, I said, what is the most important thing about reinvention? She said, is opening your mind to open your eyes to see all the reinvention possibilities that throw themselves in front of you every single day. And it's absolutely true. Once you, you know, it's like, it's like when you decide you're going to buy a car, you're going to buy, like we just, we sold two cars and we bought ourselves a little Mazda down here because we didn't need two suburban cars and we needed nothing that was rolling close to the ground because um, there's so many potholes in Mm. Louisiana and New Orleans. So um, I decided that I was interested in um, the car that got the best rating as a subcompact was a little Mazda. And of course, as soon as I was interested in the Mazda, everybody had a Mazda. Hmm. Why is that? (laughs) How come that happens? It's because you suddenly start noticing it Mm -hmm. and it becomes your eyes are open. Your ears are open. Your mind is open. And, um, they're obvious there's science behind that as well, that you're, you're, once you train your brain and tell your brain that you're interested in something, it will go there for you. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting that the, the experiments that they've done with that whole, I wanted to see a blue feather and my goodness, now I'm seeing blue feathers everywhere. It's, It's because your subconscious has been noting them, but now it bubbles up to your conscious mind. And all of a sudden you're, you're able to see that thing that you want to focus on. That's right. Which, which is so fantastic. And, and it's something, something you said really resonated with me when you were talking about this this two years of this woman going oh nothing's happening and suddenly wow boom the changes happened it's possible that there were small changes happening yes. that she wasn't paying attention to you know what i mean yes. i mean there's definitely yes. like yes. I, I one of my clients it's interesting she she was sedentary and i said you know you don't you don't have to run you don't have to do anything big i said today just put on some shoes some running shoes that's right you know, That's tomorrow, right. stand That's on your right. porch. The next That's day, maybe right. go off your porch. And all of this is incremental. So That's so right. within, within this, I'm going to ask you a question that is going to sound pedantic and I don't mean it to. Sure. The question is, what does a successful reinvention look like? It can be whatever makes you happy. And some people reinvent into a new job. I've heard the people who are like, oh my God, I just landed that big marketing job I wanted. I didn't know that's what I wanted to do, but that's exactly what I wanted. Or it might be, you know what? I decided I'm really not an entrepreneur. I'm going to let this thing go. I was pushing it and it really wasn't the thing for me. And that's why it wasn't working out. It can be that. It can also be taking what you knew in corporate life and turning it into a consulting kind of thing. I've seen that as well, where you take it and you, you move with it to outside interests. It's very, very individual Mm -hmm. and not everybody. It's the same thing. It's when you're happy with where you're headed and if it needs to support you, it does. And everybody's in a different situation with financial support. And that can make, you know, the difference in what you have to choose as well. Oh, for sure. And and that is something that I'm curious about. When you're going through this reinvention, there is a sort of to me, an understanding that you that you that you have some resources, right? That that it's that it may be happening out of necessity internally, but maybe not externally. The question I have is, what happens when a woman wants to desperately wants to reinvent herself, but doesn't have financial resources? Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. My sister, who is an amazing, she's one of the best dermatologists on the planet. They send limousines to go take her to places so she can do diagnostics, that sort of thing. Wow. And her husband said to her, her now ex-husband, but her husband at one point said to her, whatever you decide to do, however you decide to pursue what you're going to do, know that I am behind you and I will support you financially until you're done. And she was going into med school at the time and went 
that's great. And she was able to focus on the learning part of her life so that she could now be one of the greatest dermatologists on the planet. What what happens when you don't have that? How do what is your advice to someone who wants to reinvent herself but is kind of going, I feel like I can't do that without that support? Right. Well, you have to be what I what I always say, and this is why I was going around the country before COVID speaking about why you need to have a reinvention plan in your back pocket mm. is because we don't know when we're going to have to reinvent. And you should always have a small pot of money, about a year's worth of salary, in case you need it. We don't know when the Silicon Valley Bank that we love and they love us and we're being promoted is going to go out of business over a weekend, right? right. These things happen today. It can they just happened two weeks ago. <laughs> right. I mean, this is the thing is I, I, I get frustrated sometimes because um, people are like, oh, no, everybody loves me and my law firm. I'm so happy. And I don't need to think about reinvention because I'm so great and I'm so loved. I'm like, yeah, but what if your law firm is bought? Oh, that'll never happen. And then you hear three months later, the law firm was bought and they were sold out. Mm. And it's these things happen. They have nothing to do with you or how much they love you and or, or how great you are, or how successful. And you need to plan and have that in your back pocket because you just don't know when it's going to happen. If you, That's why I always say to people, if you're thinking that there might be some reinvention in your future, come to Covey Club early. Please come two years early mm. and let us get you on the path before it's a crisis. A lot of people, as I said to you, my friends that stand in the back corner, you know, thinking they're going to get a pink slip. I mean, then you're in crisis, right? right? Hopefully you have enough money set aside so you can do something. And if you don't, you go back in and work on your reinvention on the side. The good news is, you know, again, if you can spend a year putting away for the rainy day, and as I say, if you don't have to reinvent yourself, so be it, buy yourself a car, you know, get yourself a little a little rental somewhere, buy yourself a kayak with it or whatever. You're going to have a nice little savings account. But you must have that plan because the way the world moves today, it's fast, it's rapid, it's destructive, and we never know when we're going to be a casualty. Now, if you have to hang in there, one of the good things is you can reinvent yourself on the weekends, on the evenings, during your vacations. There are a lot of things you can do. Before I started Covey Club, when it was very clear that publishing was really circling the drain. I had run four magazines. I had looked at going up into management um, in some bigger organizations, but it was very, very clear. They were firing 400 people at a time at like Time Inc around, you know, some of the really big places. And I was like, you know, I just don't think this has a future anymore. And mm. I'd always been very interested. I went to Duke in North Carolina to become a marine biologist originally. And I switched over in to English because I was a really good writer and I knew I was going to write anyway. I wasn't, I, I had to battle all the pre-meds the, who would stay up all night and they wanted to go to Duke med school. I did not. Mm. So I was like, you know what? I'm in those days being a writer, you could make a lot of money. It was a good living. Right. And I wanted to write. So I came out, I went into writing and a girlfriend of mine um, was working for one of the big beauty companies. And um, when I said, you know, I think I got to reinvent myself out of publishing. She had, she was in the public policy area of uh, a beauty company. And she said, you know, I'd gone to a, um, to a Duke event where the head of the environmental school came and spoke about what was going on in the environment and I said to her, I said, I'm like still so passionate about this. What can I do? And she said, you know, Columbia has, has you can get a degree at night uh, up at Columbia. And I was, you know, in Westchester, which is only 40 minutes out of the city. And I was in the um, city for work. And I thought, okay, I'll go check that out. She said, check it out. She said, I'll hook you up. And I was like, but I'm like 58 years old. <laughs> am I really going to do this <laughs> or 56? I can't remember how old I was. And, um, I went to the class and I was like completely blown away. And I went and I had an interview and I thought I'll never get in, but I'll apply. What the heck? 
And I actually applied, I got in and I went, um, and I ended up with a degree. Um, I have my master's in sustainability and they pulled the plug on, uh, more magazine two years before I finished my degree. Mm. And I thought what I would do is segue over into the beauty business where they need a lot of help with sustainability. They're just a complete sure. mess. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go from a declining business to a inclining business, which unfortunately is sustainability. And sustainability really is in where environmentalism and business match, right? That's where the, where the two meet is trying to find the win-wins. So they pulled the plug and I was stuck at my dining room table saying, okay, cause I was doing it at night, you know, should I do my project in Cambodia for um, sustainability or should I learn how to do MailChimp? And what happened was Covey Club kind of took off. I finished my degree and I've been doing the, the Covey Club ever since. But that was my, my backup was to go into another thing that I'd always loved and I felt very strongly about. And it was such a treat to go back to school as an adult and to learn with kids in their 20s who taught mm. me a lot about the technology that my company didn't know because my company was so far behind. And I would have gone either way, but that's what I was doing in the evenings um, as a backup. So it can be done that way. I know a lot of people who do go back now. A lot of the universities have figured out that they were living longer. Right. They they can have a second life with people who were their alumni or who were their um, former students or in a whole new way, they can bring in a lot of money with people who need to reinvent themselves. We're living longer and we're going to have many different types of careers. Things change. I mean, if you had told me in my twenties that there would be no such thing as magazines by the time I was, you know, 55, I would have laughed in your face. I would have said, you're crazy. Oh, look at these things. They're going crazy. They're going to China. Are you kidding me? And then boom, it all went away. So there are many, many ways to reinvent. And there are vacations that you can do where you go on reinvention vacations. You can go work for people um, as free interns, as adults. There are all kinds of ways to do it. Again, it's mindset. And sometimes, this is what happened to me, Isolde, interestingly enough, if you're in a job where you need to stay for the money, and that's kind of what happened to me with more, is that they were paying me decently, and it was a fancy job. It was great. I you know, had a lot of fun. I did great work. I got to hang out at the White House with Mrs. Obama. I mean, you can't complain about all these things, but I knew it was <laughs> going downhill. The, I, knew the, I knew the business overall was not healthy, right? And- so, and there were 50 people, if I decided to leave the whole magazine would have gone under because they would not have re repositioned it again. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this while I do something else. And in many cases, that's what people can do. They, you can stay at your job that you've mastered as long as you continue to do a good job and you can create interest. And I'm sure in your creativity world, this is something that you hear a lot. I hear a lot of people they find their jobs really boring and uncreative and they want something that's more fulfilling. You can create that either at night, on the weekends, on vacations. That can take the pressure off your other job that has become rote and boring, but you need to keep because it's paying the bills. And weirdly, that's what happened to me at Moore is once I started getting my degree up at Columbia, all the anger and frustration I had with them not moving forward with more and bringing it into the digital space. I mean, I gave them hundreds of ideas and everything was now can't be done, can't be done, mm -hmm. can't be done. And no one wanted to try anything new. And I was very frustrated. And so what was interesting is once I had my creativity and learning outside of the job sphere, the strange thing was it took the pressure off. I did my best work ever on the magazine and I was happier than ever because I was, I'd stopped learning on the job, but I was learning somewhere else. I'm like a learning, you know, like amoeba. I have to be learning all the time. <laughs> That's when I'm happy. 
But there was, you know, and in the old days, when I stopped learning, I would move to another magazine. I would find another mentor. I'd find another magazine. And um, you can't necessarily do that when it, you're in a declining business. So you'd be shocked at what it does when you find a balance for you. If you're in something that's boring, not rewarding, not creative, and you can find an outlet on the outside, sometimes you don't have to reinvent your actual job. I love that so much. Wow. Yes. Yes. All of that. And I feel like I should just go, Leslie Jane Seymour, mic drop. That was fantastic. <laughs> uh, this is just my learning. No, it's, no, it's, and it's great. You know, and it's funny as I'm listening to you, I'm going, yeah, I, I mean, I had a, this whole career at NASA, but while I had my career at NASA, I was also a professional musician on the side. There you go. So, so yeah, we, we can do many things. It's just about, and, and it's funny, the, the original name for this podcast that you and I are on right now was the creative mindset podcast. Mm. So it's really funny that you have been talking about that so much because it is, it, it requires us to think more openly, I think, than, than, oh, this is the only thing that I have in front of me. And it brings me back to that driving motorcycling analogy that you raised up because it is so important. And I'm really grateful that you're doing this work with women who traditionally and even to this day sort of have this prescribed set of steps from when you're a child to getting married to having children yes. and all of that and now now they're going okay what next and you're providing right. something so i'm so grateful that you're doing that i and i'm grateful that you took the time to to be on the show and honestly leslie i can be, keep you here for the next six hours <laughs> chatting because <laughs> you're and without running out of a single idea this is amazing but i know that you have a day to get back to and we are going to still record our little bonus episode sure so i was wondering before we do that if you would before i ask you my last question that i ask everybody who comes on the show Tell me where someone who wants to know more about the Covey Club can find the Covey Club and also you. Yes. So CoveyClub.com, C-O-V-E-Y club.com. And then um, we are on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm there too. And my LinkedIn is L-E-S-L-E-Y, Jane Seymour, S-E-Y-M-O-U-R. And we try to play across all those platforms. And it would be Covey Club for all of the platforms too? Yes, you can Perfect. find either me or that. And then the podcast is called Reinvent Yourself with Leslie Jane Seymour. Awesome. Are you, are you incidentally, are you named after the queen? No, hilariously, hilariously, my name was always Leslie Jane. Ah. And I never really used it until I got into magazines. And um, we found out that it was when very early on when you were a writer, we have someone discovered that if you had three names, it sounded more professional huh? and that you should use your full name. It was totally hilarious. And it was probably my twenties. And I was like, okay, I'm going to use the full name. <laughs> wow. My, my full name would, would be miles long. So there's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no way as no an immigrant. Point. Yeah. There, as an no immigrant, point. there's no way, there's no way I, I have, my name is way too long for that. Okay. Uh, well, so thank you for that. And I'm the links are going to be in the show notes anyway. Great. So, because I know people learn differently and some like to read it, some like to hear that's it. So that's right. cool. That's and, right. But I do want to ask you one last question before we sure. sign off for this main part of the episode. And the question is this, I, I, this is something I ask everybody who comes on the show and it's a silly question, but I find that it yields some profound answers. Sure. So here is the question. If you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite <laughs> anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? It ain't over till you say it's over. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Again, Leslie Jane Seymour, mic drop. Fabulous. Leslie, thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to come back in just a second to do the quick little bonus episode. But I want to thank you. And I'm super grateful. And I'm blubbering because I'm a fangirl. I'm a Leslie Jane Seymour fangirl now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Solutions Podcast. You know what to do. You know how to find Covey Club. You know how to find Leslie Jane Seymour. You know how to subscribe to this show if you're just checking it out for the first time. Until next time, I, as always, remind you, be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in. Thank you.